Welcome everyone. I'm Diane Rodriguez, the assistant director of here at the San Francisco Law Library, and I just want to remind you that we are open to everyone. We have books, free databases, uh, professional law librarians to help you research and learn all about the law, and we invite you to explore the library today after the program. Uh, a few housekeeping items. Uh, reminders before we get started here, today's program is being recorded and transcribed and will be available on our YouTube channel soon. If you'd like MCLE credit, um, please make sure that you sign in at the desk over there and we have handouts for you if you'd like to uh, pick those up. Um, also, please uh, take a moment and silence your personal phones. And to get to our matter at hand here. We are honored and thrilled to introduce today's speaker, Mr. James Brosnahan. He's here to speak about his new memoir, Justice at Trial. Mr. Brosnahan, as you all well know, is a world-renowned defense lawyer, federal prosecutor, author, and advocate. He's tried over 150 jury trials and is a member of California's Trial Lawyer Hall of Fame. And here at the Law Library, we have a special fondness for him as we deeply appreciated his great support to the Law Library in 2013, when he testified at the Board of Supervisors uh, budget hearing in support of a new and permanent home for the Law Library, which is our current space here. He and his advocacy um, helped the Law Library greatly during that time and give us what we have today. So please join me in a warm welcome to Mr. James Brosnan. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. You know, librarians make me feel good just to be here with them and give me a chance to say that uh, I know in parts of the country there are people who decide now, they think about what books you can read and what books you can't read. And uh, those of us who read books like yourself uh, don't agree with that. Uh, my guess is I hope you don't agree with it. We'll see what we can do about that. Um, so this much is true. I tried cases for 60 years and uh, all kinds of cases, civil and criminal. Uh, we're going to talk to you a little bit about the book, but it's really not so much about the book as the people in the book, because a lot of the heroes in the book are not me at all. It is a memoir. But uh, I saw lawyers, I saw judges, I saw people, clients, who showed enormous courage at one time or another. We're going to talk about some of those people. Uh, I saw the change. When you think that I started uh, in the practice of law in 1959, it was uh, quite different. And uh, I think in a lot of ways, it's better now than it was then. And we'll talk a little bit about, about that. Um, down the street from where I walked in in February of uh, 1963, as, as a federal prosecutor, I started in Phoenix and uh, was lucky enough to get a job here in San Francisco. And... Uh, it was it was a great office. It was a, a wonderful, strong office. Um, there were some great lawyers here. If you don't mind me talking about my memories a little bit, uh, although I will tell you that the 19 chapters in the book were selected by me because they're newsworthy now, like the Mexican border, which we'll talk a little bit about. What What is it really like? on the Mexican border. And some of the people were like Jake Ehrlich, Alan, who defended Allen Ginsberg's poem, Howell, in the 1950s. That poem is about the gay life. And that's the first time I will mention to you that these were my heroes. You know, frankly, trial lawyers, we're not, we're not like other people. I mean, why would we? Why would we defend some of the people that we defend? Why would we do that? And um, Jake Ehrlich didn't have any problem with it, and he demolished an expert, a literature expert from California, 
uh, on his cross-examination, one of the best cross-examinations I ever saw. Agnes O'Brien Smith started law practice in San Francisco in 1940. I don't think that was easy. I think that was, I wouldn't even dare try to tell you what I think it might have been like. Because um, my wife was a classmate of mine, and she was one of nine women in a class of 525 students. The point there, if you missed it, was she picked me out of all of them. Okay, and to give you a to give you a sense that I'm not a high bomb person, our roommates decided that we should have a cook. A very gender you know, orientation, the guys, you know, in the 60s decide, in the 50s actually, decide we have to have a cook. So Carol came in and was a cook. We all promised each other we wouldn't try to date the cook. <laughs> and it would just get messy and it wouldn't work and we'd lose a cook. And this, this just wouldn't be a good thing. So we promised that we wouldn't date her. We got engaged three weeks later. <laughs> and we got married three weeks after that. And we just had our 65th uh, wedding anniversary. So all those, thank you very much. I'm always playing for the hand. Uh, so anytime you want to do that. Um, Joe Alioto, these are the people that inspired me. Joe Alioto, referring to later the mayor, I went to a program and there was a table there like this, and it was all about antitrust. And there were, let's say, four people there, I think, and they sat there, the others, and talked about horizontal, vertical, and all this, these things which were very important in antitrust, but not that interesting. And Joe Alioto got up, stepped out front like this, and said, I want to talk to you about economic justice. That's what I want to talk about. And I thought, he's the man. And he was. Great, talented people. Dorsey Redland in the 1960s, specialized in representing stevedores on the docks in San Francisco. Tried a lot of cases. I tried, I think, two against her. And she was a splendid trial lawyer. Uh, Cecil Poole was my boss, the U.S. attorney, the first black U.S. attorney in the United States. What did he teach me? Power. Being a lawyer is a powerful position. For starters, you have the, the uh, power of advice. You sit in a holding cell and tell a person you ought to do this or you ought to do that, and you're trying to forecast what will happen if they don't do it, and you're doing your best. But a prosecutor has enormous power. Um, I... My first criminal trial was a pro bono case. And it lasted a month, was in federal court, right here. And it was two poverty workers from Oakland. They were indicted because the administration was trying to show that poverty lawyers and the poverty programs were uh, expensive and they weren't productive, none of which was true. And they were supposed to, and they did, find jobs for people in Oakland. But they also took some of the money and opened up a food bank, and people came. And so that was our defense. The government claimed there's some money missing. The money went for a food bank. Judge Harris allowed it us to put on 28 witnesses to testify as to what it's like to be hungry. And that's what the courts do as far as I'm concerned. The problems that America can't resolve, they 
sort of work on, but they can't fix it, they all come into courts. And on a given day, um, clients of the food bank uh, came in uh, and testified this way, quote, I'm not going to read a lot from the book, but I've got a couple of things you might be interested in. And of course, as we are here enjoying the company of each other, there are people in Oakland who have these symptoms. I would get contractions in my stomach, lightheadedness, stomach aches, constant tiredness, and headaches. The doctor said I had anemia. I constantly felt nervous. Where was my next meal coming from? Where, and then I say, where can a hungry person in America go and explain their suffering? Who wants to listen? That day, the jury listened. And some of those jurors were from very nice areas. So lawyers, see the problems on a daily basis. It's just a common thing that we do. So there's another thing that we do, and this in my lifetime has been a wonderful development. As I said, my wife was in the class of 59 in law school, and as I was, and she's a been a judge over, I don't know if any of you know this, but a judge, is now retired, but she was a judge in Alameda County for 40 years. And she and other women who came in to the profession brought with them their experiences. And I'll give you one specific example. I practiced law for probably 20 years and never saw a case in state court or anywhere else on child abuse or spousal abuse. It was one of those things that was not the subject matter of criminal prosecution, unless it was a murder, of course. That was different. But women came in in large numbers, I want to say in the late 70s and then the 80s, and they brought with them their experience and their voices, and they wanted to be heard. That's what lawyers do. We get up and we talk, as I'm doing right here now. And then all of a sudden, in Superior Court in Sacramento one day, there was a stack of files like that. And I said to the clerk, what, what are those? He said, those are child abuse cases. That is the enrichment that can happen when previously excluded members of a class are brought into the legal profession. And that is not over, no matter what Justice Roberts thinks, because as you may know, he's declared that that problem of inclusion is solved, basically, and the federal government should have no role in that. I think that's unfortunate. I say it with respect because he's the chief, but I think that's unfortunate. Uh, I had a good piece of advice when I started. That was, the book is not about you, I was told. It's about the reader. And that aspect is really true. When you're talking to a jury, it's not about you. The young lawyers think it's, you know, will I do it right and all that. They worry about that. But it's not about them. It's about the jury or the judge or the arbitrator. I got a call one day and asked if I'd go to Northern Ireland to investigate the murders of two lawyers. And they're shown up on your screen. On the left, for those in the back row, is Patrick Panukin. And on the 
On the right is Shrewsbury Nelson. And they had 10 years apart. They had vital practices in Northern Ireland that involved civil rights. Patrick Finucane was one of the finest lawyers you meet anywhere. He went to the international court and embarrassed the British government. I spent, I was in Northern Ireland seven times during the troubles, drawn to it because Brosnahan is an Irish name. Uh, it's just that simple. There are things you get interested in. And uh, there were many threats against Patrick Finucane. And then one night, on a Sunday evening, sitting in his kitchen with his wife and his kids, two men burst into the, the room and killed him on the spot in front of his wife and his children. She was wounded. Why? Well, for, for starters, he was Catholic. And that's all it took for 25 years. They would kill anybody. And it was reciprocated by the IRA who would kill people. And if I tell you that we solved the murder, you might be skeptical, but we did. A witness came to us and was the person who gave the guns to the two men that burst in. And he told us their names. Why Now, why would he do that? He had done that with about five or six people in Northern Ireland. So drawing myself up on my full Esquire attire, I wrote to the Attorney General of England. Hello, Attorney General. My name is Brosnahan. I'm a lawyer in San Francisco. We know who murdered Patrick Finucan, and we have the names. <laughs> Happy to talk to you anytime you want. I wasn't in the room when, if he ever read the letter, but I think it went something like this. <laughs> Four months went by. Out of word. Finally, a note came from an underling below the underling below the underling, which said, we don't handle this matter. Uh, it should all be handled in Northern Ireland, so you had to write to them. So I did. I wrote to the right person in Northern Ireland, never heard back. The witness who gave us the information and who gave us the names walked out of his house one morning down the steps and was shot dead. Just another death in Northern Ireland, when there were so many. Rosemary Nelson was part of a new wave of women and lawyers, graduated from Queens College, came over to the United States because of her practice, she wanted to report death threats against people who were lawyers, testified before Congress, had enormous courage, Married to a nice man who I met, who was an account, and had a daughter and two sons. And one morning, she backed her car down this short driveway, turned her car, like every day when she's going to work, she had her own office. The car went down. When she put the foot on the brake, the bomb, that had been placed under the driver's seat went off and mortally wounded her. Her daughter uh, heard the sound at the school, which was up on the hill. So I'm telling you about two lawyers in a country where all kinds of people were murdered, but it it seemed to me that you don't kill the lawyers, and especially you don't kill the lawyers when the police are involved, which they were in both of those cases. So 
Brosnahan descended from people who came over on the boat out of the hunger in the 1840s and 50s, sat in the office of the chief constable, and we confronted him about the problem of his people being involved in the murder. It was the most fun I've had in Northern Ireland any time I was over there. And uh, he kept getting up and saying, thank us for coming. And we kept sitting and asking him more questions about whether, wouldn't it be good if you could get control of your, your officers? Just a thought. Um, when opportunity knocks for a lawyer, you ought to accept it. So I was uh, fortunate enough to get a job as a federal prosecutor in Phoenix, as I mentioned, where we started. We lived there for three years. And um, so I'm, I'm there my first day, and I get through the first day. And I've had no briefing by anybody as to how you do this or how you decide to prosecute or not. And my boss came in the second day. We had only five lawyers in the office, very small office. And he said, there's a trial on Monday. Will you do it? And that was the fulfillment of my dream in college. I try a case. Yeah, that's my first case. And I said, sure, I'll do it. And he gave me the file. I opened it. It was a first-degree murder case with a request for the death penalty. <laughs> wow, what an interesting Tuesday this is. And how will I do that? And I realized that law school had almost nothing to do with my assignment for the following Monday. And uh, the story is in the book. Uh, and I tried it, and of course, uh, once you try a murder case, you think, you know, you can imagine my ego at that point, because we did, we did win it. And there's stories in there about the defendants, and they had stabbed to death the young man. Uh, they were both teenagers. This is asking for the death penalty for teenagers, which I didn't do it. I, I knew enough to not, not do that. I told the jury they should not do that. But it shows you the power. And I still remember it. I mean, I was a prosecutor for five years. There is kind of a thrill when you're talking to the FBI agent and you hold up your hand, and you say, book them, except except that person's life will probably never be the same. And that's the power of the prosecutor, the enormous power. Why do lawyers do what they do? I touched upon that. I think that's a fascinating question. And I write about it in the book. I don't think that we care that much about public opinion. I really don't. I think that my answers are not highfalutin. Uh, there are highfalutin answers as to why lawyers do what they do. But uh, I think we're a little contrary. And I am. I know that, you know, I'm in a law firm with 1,000 lawyers, so it doesn't sound right that I'm an outsider, except if you know the firm at all, we have a lot of outsiders in the firm <laughs> doing things that other people don't necessarily want to do, and we've done that over the years. Um, next time you see a despised person and a lawyer standing next to them, there's one exception that's Recently, I came to realize that not everybody's entitled to a defense. If that person is going to get you investigated, disbarred, or indicted, okay? That's the one exception. I'm not mentioning any candidates or, <laughs> you know, I don't know why you're laughing, but uh, uh, 
Is there any case I wouldn't take? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, here's, a, here's a case that I loved in its own way. The, the woman in the middle here, in the front row, uh, that's Karen Snell, by the way. I don't know if any of you know Karen Snell, but she's a lawyer in San Francisco. Uh, standing next to me, and there's Socorro Aguilar. And Socorro Aguilar is, uh, was a religious worker in her church in Mexico. She's a Mexican national, and she helped refugees from Guatemala and El Salvador. And many of them had fled those countries and had come up north and were uh, apprehended, I guess you'd say. And she had the problem literally came to her door in Nogales. She'd be in the church and they'd come in and she'd give them a place to sleep in Nogales. And I spent six months in trial in that case. And The thing about lawyering, which I love, actually, is what we learn, because there aren't too many people, certainly probably none in our government, that ever talk to a refugee. And I did. Uh, Socorro wanted us that first day to understand her world in Nogales. By the way, she had received Woman of the Year from the Sonoran uh, government. And for the same conduct, she was indicted by the federal officials. And she took us to a Mexican prison. And we interviewed the women prisoners. And you can imagine their clothes that come 900 miles and suffered serious problems. You can just imagine apprehended by the Mexican police sometimes. And then we went over to the men's area. Half of the room was open to the sky and half of it was covered. And Socorro had brought chips and hot dogs for them, and they ate those. There were about 40 men in the room. And here's what I wrote. Socorro suddenly began to gesture at the men and the lawyers to form a circle. She organized a prayer, holding hands with the 40 men in a large circle. I prayed for the first time in 30 years. Head bowed, my thoughts came naturally. Save these men from the worst, deliver them, protect them. There are images that stay with you when you try a case. And I interviewed one young man who was in uh, his school. His brother was in the school. Brother was 16, he was 14. They looked out the window and there were armed men around the school. They came in, took the older boys, including his brother, and he never saw his brother again. You can't make that up. And lawyers gather those facts, and that's, that's what we do. Now, on a lighter note, should you pick a red-faced juror? Well, it depends. I uh, represented a man right here in federal court who had a liquor business, a, a prospering one, and but they had allegedly sold liquor for a price below the federally mandated liquor price, which they had at that time. And so there we are. We're going to try the case. 
were interviewing the jurors. And the prosecutor at one point says, now this case involves, and he makes it sound like Western civilization has been destroyed, basically. There's not a, there's not a stone on a stone. No buildings are left because of what these defendants did. And then he announces in that tone of the end of the world, they sold liquor at a low price. <laughs> Juror number three had a red face. If it wasn't for the fact that it would be an ethnic slur on my own people, the Irish people, which I would never do, you can guess what his name might be, you see? And here's what he looked at the prosecutor like this. <laughs> and the prosecutor was righteous. Because I was a perfect prosecutor for five years. You understand the, the difference here. And this, this guy was a compulsive, righteous guy every day. I can't imagine what his family life was like. And uh, so he, he didn't notice that look. And then we got to the final argument and I was talking about, I couldn't think of an argument. I mean, they violated the statute. That's not good. That makes a difficult case. So I stayed up. I don't do this usually, but I was up all night. I was trying to figure out. Finally, I said with a convincing voice to the jury, um, this case does not fit this statute. And that's the best I could do. I don't know what it meant even. What does it mean? <laughs> if you did it, you did it, you know. There's a few cases that interest me greatly where there's jury nullification and the jurors have a sense of justice. Justice, I'm actually writing another book that involves the concept of justice because I've seen everybody trying to get it or not get it, as the case may be. But nobody, including philosophers, are quite sure what it means. What does it mean? And they, I'll tell you the end result was that they acquitted my client because they didn't think it fit. They were out in the hall and one of them said, this, this statute just didn't fit this case. I said, oh, really? Is that right? Okay, very good. You know, we have our moments, and the book makes this clear, and then we have moments of defeat. And if it's a civil case, there can be serious consequences. If there's a criminal case, and the person is convicted, <laughs> the marshal comes over to your client and takes them by the arm and walks them through the door. And you know that person's not coming out for a long time. So I didn't write a book where everything was hunky-dory, but I wrote a book, hopefully, with some candor in it. Um, so, okay. Some of those names that I mentioned early would take any kind of case, and they were my heroes. Civil, criminal, didn't matter. They thought they could try any kind of case. I like that idea, and I can honestly tell you I did it. I tried 17, uh, seven, rather, admiralty cases. I tried a child custody case, one of the toughest cases I ever tried. Uh, those are terrible. Just you name it, I did it. Well, so, uh, when uh, my client uh, asked me to represent him, I said, okay, what, what, what's the charge? They, they've accused me of making bombs in the Ingleside section of San Francisco in my house. So, of course, I said, well, I always say, okay. And then 27 agents surrounded his house and arrested him. And the neighbors as you might imagine, were in some consternation 
But they, they always say the same thing. It's funny. When the terrorist is arrested, they, they seem like such nice people, you know. And Ingleside was never quite the same there for a couple of weeks. Um, but he didn't do it. And the FBI cheated. There's no other word for it. I don't want to convince you to not watch Law and Order. I'm sure there's some people here like myself that love to watch it. And um, so there we are in trial. And on a late Saturday afternoon, about 4.30, I was doing what scientists call pure research. You don't know what you're looking for. You know you need something, but you don't know what you're looking for. And all of a sudden, I realized on these photographs that had been supplied to us, they, the FBI had rigged up the evidence to make it look like this was bomb-making material. And they had glue, and they had wires, and they had batteries, all in a uh, container, except they had moved them all from all over the house. They had rigged the evidence. And this is where lawyers need to know what, what the rules are for the FBI. And one of them is you must always note where something is found. For example, in a murder case, if the deceased is here and the gun is here, maybe that was suicide, who knows? But if the deceased was here and the gun was over there and they took it and brought it and put it all together, that's not good. The cross-examination of the agent is in the book and it shows you uh, what can happen. There are no rules for trial, only situation. Now, that's a pretty broad statement. The young lawyers, and I, I taught, I uh, loved it at uh, Berkeley, Berkeley Law for 10 years. They want to know what the rules are. That's because they're getting trained all the wrong way. Because you're in a trial, it's like, okay, what's happening now? Where are we? That's what you have to do. So in this case, and I'll cut this short, but... It's one of my wife's favorite chapters. She thinks it would make a movie. Uh, I have to tell you, my, my three uh, children and my grandchildren and my wife all like this book. And that was the first big test. <laughs> I mean, if they don't like it, then maybe I'll just not go forward. But they do. And she likes it to be a movie because it's about a woman who started with low economics, had to drop out of college at one point, went back to college, got a job at Wells Fargo Bank, um, advanced in the job, eventually became the head of the Bechtel Corporation, uh, which is, of course, a, a huge uh, corporation and unusual for her uh, to be the head of that and then became the chairperson of Hewlett Packard. And an aging financial man took umbrage at her and uh, hired people, top people in Washington, D.C., to create the impression that she had committed a crime. And so there we are. And there's a lot of interesting back and forth with the prosecutors and all that that's in the book. But there she is. And uh, I did, did something that no lawyer would ever want to do. And all lawyers would say is the wrong idea. And they would be right most of the time. She's one of the most articulate pleasant, reasonable people that I have represented. I told her, uh, the 
By the way, her, she was on the cover of Time magazine with dark lines through her and all this kind of stuff. I mean, she was, you know, they can convert you in a matter of hours from chairperson a Hewlett Packard to the person who is ruining privacy in America. That was the charge. And I told her, you ought to go on 60 Minutes. They always call and they ask that someone go on 60 Minutes. You always tell them no, because anything they say can be used against them in cross-examination. And so I, I said, I think you should do it. And she, she did it. And of course, she appeared before 14 million people. I told her, any lawyer you ask about this is going to say this is a terrible idea. About a week later, there was a huge dinner. Uh, I think it was at the Fairmont. The room was packed with celebrities. and The governor was there and all that. And they had awarded her the uh, Business Woman of the Year. And she told them, you, sh you shouldn't give me this because I'm indicted. And they said, no, no, we insist. When they called her name, she got a standing ovation from 500 people. And it turned out that, as the book describes, that was um the right thing to do different i want to quickly mention a couple of things i don't want to leave time for questions which we're happy to do there she is by the way she taught me an important lesson when all this was going on and i submitted this to the prosecutor she had Stage four cancer. Stage four is the worst. And I never heard her in all the time I represented her complain about that or anything. Uh, it was just quite a lesson. Well, okay. Ronald Reagan uh, told the country, I quote, we did not repeat, did not trade weapons or anything else for hostages. Uh, how should I put this gently? What shall I say, Carly? It was a bleeping lie. And they had done exactly that. The top of the government knew it, including Casper Weinberger from the Bay Area, Brazil. I prosecuted him and spent um, 10 weeks reading top secret documents, you know, top secret documents, basically there's this mean looking person who swears you in and says, you know, we're going to have to kill you if you, you know, if you, if you do this, we're going to have to kill you. And I will just say that, give you one example, Weinberg had a lot to commend him in his career. Let's be clear about that. <laughs> He lied to Congress, a joint committee, appeared before them, told them support of Reagan that he didn't do or what he, what he did, and talked to FBI agents one day who came to his office, and they said to him, we understand you keep notes. And he said, no, I don't keep notes. And they left. He got up. He walked around his desk over to his notes, and he wrote in the notes, FBI agents in today asked me if I keep notes. <laughs> I told them I don't, okay? So the whole story of Washington, uh, in, in my view of Washington, is in one of the chapters Handling a political case, and there are people learning this as I speak. There's a difference between political truth and courtroom truth, and the difference is cross-examination. 
and and the justice system. It's very different. Um, I think I'll conclude with this to allow time for questions. Um, I did it. I've argued two cases in the U.S. Supreme Court. And the first one is in the book, an interesting case. And uh, then uh, I, my phone rang one day, and uh, the voice on the other end said, I understand you had an incident with William Rehnquist. And uh, I said, well, that was a long time ago. <laughs> and a lot of years have gone by. And People have apologized for what they did. You know, why are you calling me? He said, well, have you been watching the, the hearings on his confirmation for uh, chief justice? I said, yes, I've been watching it. They said, um, we want you to come testify about what happened. And I said, well, um, you know, as they say, a lot of years go by. They said, have you read his testimony when he was put on the court as a justice in the court? I said, no, I haven't. He said, well, you better read it, because he denied that it happened. And I said, oh. I said, if you issue a subpoena, I'll go. And. So I went back to read what he said, and here's the incident. The year is 1962. I am a federal prosecutor. The boss said, Jim, uh, on Tuesday, you be responsible for complaints, because there are always complaints. People call up and complain. I said, OK. So that's what I did. The phone rang from a school where people were voting. And they said, uh, the Republican challengers are challenging everybody and taking a great deal of time to do it. And the long lines are happening, and people are getting discouraged and turning away. It was in a Mexican-American people of color district uh, in south of Phoenix. So I said, OK, I got an FBI agent. We went down. It was one of the few times I flashed my badge. It's amazing what happens when you flash your badge. Everybody just calms down, which is what happened, basically. And there was Rehnquist. And he was not only there, but he was in charge of the whole program. You know, I said early, that uh, I picked these cases because they're still current. You know that program by the Republicans is not only in existence, it's been defined in a way that reduces a lot of Americans from voting. So it calmed down. I, I left, and then I, years later, I'm asked to go back to Washington. And so I get sworn in, and they grill me for two hours. The Democrats were almost worse, you know. Wasn't he killing babies down there at the school, you know, and so forth? Wasn't he slashing them with swords or whatever they could think of? No, 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 no. And then Senator Hatch decided he was going to take me on. I never had more fun in my life. <laughs> There's a movie. I can never quite remember what it is. Somebody goes back to Washington and tells off everybody. That's a great movie. I think they play it. What is it? Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Mr. Smith goes to, no, no. Mr. Brosnahan goes to Washington. They're not paying attention. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Uh, because I was at the school and Senator Hatch was not. And after a long, cross-examination. I looked at him and I said, you think I made it up? He said, yes, I think this is on national television. I think you made it up. I said, well, I would rather be at Jack's restaurant in San Francisco having my favorite lunch on Friday 
than sitting here looking at you. <laughs> and the crowd was against Rehnquist, and they erupted. And the next day, the, the quote, my quote about Jack's restaurant, was in the New York Times, and it was in the Wall Street Journal, I think, or uh, the Washington paper. And the next week, I went to have my favorite lunch at Jack's. I had never met Jack. I, I didn't know if there was a Jack. He came out with a $200 bottle of wine and gave me, because I had given him national publicity. There's one last point to this. I got a, another case in the US Supreme Court. And I went into the same chambers, which are so fantastic, and the quill pins on the table and the polished chairs. The whole atmosphere is one of awe. And there in the center of the US Supreme Court, is William Rehnquist. And what happened in that case is in the book. But I don't want to give it away. So you got to read the book. I mean, that's, you know, so forth. Um, we have time for questions. And, you know, a book, I will say this, a book takes over itself when you're writing a book. I kept talking in the book to young people, young people who've had difficulties, and to show them you can overcome those difficulties. Uh, I, I think I'll mention this. Between the ages of three and six, I was confined to bed on a diagnosis of rheumatic fever and possible heart involvement. Last week was my 90th birthday. I think that may have been an incorrect diagnosis, I'm hoping. And uh, so uh, when I cross-examined doctors, which I did in about, I don't know, 30 or 40 cases, there's a special edge to that. <laughs> and I just wish you could, could have come and seen me because I, I would know more about that area of law of medicine than the doctor would. So, okay, any old questions? Which I didn't mention, but I have worked for years since I actually, in, the, in the, one of my murder cases, uh, before Gideon, the judge looked down and appointed a young man, who's a little bit younger than I was, I think, to defend a murder case. And I thought, no, that's not right. And I've been working, I have worked on that with the Bar Association uh, as of today, no matter what court you go into, there are people in that court who don't have a lawyer. And so that's my general reaction to, to the issue and that's a very widespread problem. Okay. My, my uh, first question on my petitioner of to the Supreme Court was, Congress shall make no law bridging the right of the people to petition the government for regress of grievances. You know, that's exactly what this law did. I would, it's almost like I asked you to ask me that question. When I say I've been on this issue my whole life, oh, professional life, I worked for a number of years to establish a civil right to counsel. And I still think that's correct. And that goes back to, if there's a civil right to counsel, if you have a civil case, let's say not every case, but a lot of cases, you'll have a lot more litigation, and there are people that don't want that. And I think that's wrong. Next next question, though. I, I saw your YouTube. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the current Supreme Court uh, regarding uh, Trump? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Will you share that with us? I do. Uh, 
I'm giving a, a talk on Monday on the latest cases, but I, I found myself looking at all the cases that are coming. There's only one case in this term that they've decided. Why is that? Because all the others could be classified as very important big cases. But I think you have to look at each case. If they're crazy, if they're really nuts, if there's five of them that are don't have any understanding of the judiciary, and that might be true, mm -hmm. it might be true, they will step in and save him from these cases. But why they would do that and brand themselves as what was it they were accused of when they were nominated and confirmed by this by the Judiciary Committee. I don't know why they would do that. Yes. Early on in your talk, you mentioned something about book selection. In other words, someone telling you what you should or shouldn't read. Yeah. I would wonder if you could just elaborate about how you might approach that problem now that we're in a library. <laughs> Got a place I can go and get my talk? <laughs> uh, this is related actually to your question. I don't understand why the Democrats in the Senate are fundamentally silent at this point in our nation's history. I don't understand that. And uh, I'm not talking just about maybe a little press release or something. I'm talking about the eloquence that is necessary to confront and to embarrass and to take on the censorship efforts that are that people are, and there's a world of material. I wasn't kidding about the librarians. They uh, never, never attack librarians, okay? They just, they're very, they're tough. When it comes to their books, they are tough, and they should be. Um, is the First Amendment is very strong with regard to saying what's in your possession. And I did a lot of First Amendment cases. It's not quite as strong on your right to obtain it. Now, some of those cases are about the government, whether you can, the Pentagon Papers, you go back to the US Supreme Court, I don't know if you remember that case, but uh you know could you acquire those those documents i am very concerned that what we have now is if not a majority Gorsuch, thomas alito think they're going to change the first amendment this is an authoritarian court they believe that it's their job to limit people's rights and find arguments that are very articulate and very complicated, and very interesting. And I heard Scalia, I was just watching on uh, my computer the other day, and there's Scalia, and he makes a strong argument about going back to when the statute was passed, including the Constitution, as though nothing's ever happened. The problem with that, I'm doing a lot of writing right now but, uh, on things like this. The problem with that is, here's my philosophy of law. Anybody got a pencil, you're gonna write this down. This, this is it. Uh, my philosophy of law is if it, if it isn't got a close relationship to the people, by which I mean all Americans, and what their problems are today. I read a couple of papers this morning. The problems are just like that. 
if they're not attuned to make law consistent with the needs of people, then I think we ought to have different judges. I really do. And there are philosophers, John, uh, John Dewey for one, who wrote uh, a lot of good papers about law and what it should be, and very thoughtful uh, things. So I, 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 you know, I, I'm not alone. A lot of us are very concerned. I'll tell you something. I've, I've been talking in, uh, I went up to Seattle and I went to Chicago and I was talking and like giving a talk similar to this one. And uh, people are worried about a dictator. Is there no senator? No member of the United States Senate that could call a press conference tomorrow. There has never been more negative material against the candidate than there is against Donald Trump at this time. Is there and there's silence from the United States Senate? Well, the problem I have is that I read all these great speeches over the years. And Cicero gave a speech on Quintilian because Quintilian brought troops into Rome and he, that was a violation of the Constitution. And there's a painting that shows all the senators moving away from Quintilian as Cicero is talking. Where is the oratory to save our country at this time if you believe that it needs to be saved? And censorship is one thing, but telling women to bear children, that you will bear children, somebody's going to die. Somebody's going to die after the refusal of an abortion. It's going to happen. Uh, it's, I live in Berkeley. There you go. Those are my opinions. Yes. I mean, that's good question that we're all thinking so why why not why is there no one no one in the senate doing anything why why, why are the democrats so silent my my general answer is the wrong people are giving advice they're super cautious wait they're waiting for someone else to do it i think or they 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 think he's going to be defeated nobody seems i taught rhetoric at berkeley law for 10 years Nobody seems to understand what he's doing. You know what he's doing yesterday? He's showing he's very strong. And you hear that among his supporters. He went right to court. He just didn't take anything from that judge. He spoke out. He's tough. That's what he's doing. And nobody seems publicly to understand it. If you're, if you're a United States senator, you can call a press conference and say, look, I have never been more worried about our future, and here's why. Dictator, his first year is going to put people in camps. This, this, quote, 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 quote. And I'm not giving up on this. You know what bothers me even more? What an opportunity for a senator. And it's been done in the past. Yes, in the back. Sounds like you're off the direction of my question. What advice would you give a senator to how to speak up without making it sound like they're part of a conspiracy to shut down Trump? Well, who made up that conspiracy, says the senator? Who says there was a conspiracy? Did he present any evidence? No. He speaks in three word sentences. What he says, his, how clever he is. If you don't fight today, and he's talking to a crowd outside the Capitol, you won't have a country left. That's incitement. That's what that is. In, under the First Amendment rule, that's incitement. That's what he did. We don't have... I, I'm just... I have to be careful now, but I'm going to say it anyway. We don't have an attorney general. 
we don't have an attorney general. If we did, they would deal with it. Yes. I was just going to say, Liz Cheney is brave enough. She lost her seat, and she just wrote a book that we have to do everything we can. To yeah. Help, help so she's a good example. Yeah, she's a very good example. One last question in the back. I hope you know what she says about today, like your first case, the capital trial of the juvenile. I just wanted to know if their cases were separate or if they were merged. Well, I had to admit this as I'm writing the book. Everything about the case was wrong. First of all, there was no motion to sever them. Remember now, I, I start working on Tuesday and I start the case on the following Monday. But their lawyer wasn't very good. Did I understand that he wasn't very good? Imperfectly, he made very few objections. Um, one law student up in Seattle asked me, shouldn't you have disqualified yourself from this case? If I knew enough, I would have. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I want to go to trial, and here it is. And uh, The next thing I know, uh, there I am. And I got through it okay, but there were, I've often, I'm sure he's no longer with us, but if, if he brought a motion of some kind at this late date, I think I, I might join it. Some, like yes or no questions. Um, do you prefer prosecution or defense? Do I think what? Do you prefer prosecution or defense? Uh, I was prosecuting but, but uh, in the murder prefer? case. What do you, you prefer, prefer prosecuting? Oh, or defending trial. <laughs> <laughs> trial. Did you say trial? You have a trial for me? What is that? What you said? <laughs> any, any. I've taken cases that really made my partners wonder. You know, was I okay? <laughs> Um, any trial, courtrooms, I, I do miss that. I miss the courtrooms. And, uh, but I'm writing about law, so it's good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, I did one other thing. <laughs> I just got this from my daughter, who, as I say, likes the book. <laughs> and it's, it's got a circle, and the title is Content Analysis of the Memoir. And here are the, here are the parts of, of uh, colored sections here. Artistic license, verifiable true, possible but unlikely. <laughs> Misremembered details, <laughs> dubious memories, disputed facts, myth making, rose tinted nostalgia, <laughs> libelous score settling. <laughs> there is one of those in the book. <laughs> and bullshit. <laughs>